coming up. You know, it's interesting how a band can blow up on the other side of the pond, you know, in the UK, and be one of the most renowned bands of his time. And then over here in the States, just a one-hit wonder. Well, today's band and this song is a hell of a lot more than that. They were trailblazers in their native England with 30 top 40 hits over the course of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. 17 of those went to the top 10. In America, they conquered the charts in 1983 with their only hit stateside, but it was a big one. A classic we're still singing along to pretty much every week. It's the story of a band where every member came from a working class family trapped in cramped quarters, and several members even had criminal records before they hit the big time. It's a compelling story of a band of brothers who rose above poverty and crime to create a musical movement that changed everything. We break down the sentimental classic by the working man's Pink Floyd, coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember recording your favorite songs off of the radio and just hoping and praying that the DJ wouldn't talk over the start of the song or the end, you're going to dig this channel of pure musical nostalgia. Uh, make sure to subscribe below right now. Click the big red button. I know you'll find something to dig on this channel. Click the bell so you always know when our interviews are dropping. Also, check us out on Patreon. That helps us to keep it a daily channel. Again, we're self-funded, and that helps us so much, and our merch as well. It's time for another edition of one of my favorite series on here, Bottle Lightning. It's where we celebrate a song or an album that was king for a day or many days. Uh, here we honor artists and bands that rocketed up the charts, but for reasons unknown, weren't able to sustain that success. Uh, called by some as one-hit wonders, we celebrate them instead as lightning in a bottle. Previous episodes, we've covered Broken Wings by Mr. Mister, uh, Wishing Well by Terrence Trent Darby, and She Drives Me Crazy by Fine Young Cannibals. All of those are one album uh, where they had multiple hits. Take these broken wings Wish me love for wishing well Today, we explore a band and their signature American hit, but the reality is, before I even mention the band, they're superstars, legendary. With so many hits in their native UK, they, they could compete there with pretty much anyone in their time, from Elton John to Duran Duran. They actually had 30 top 40 hits over the course of uh, four decades. Their most successful run uh, was the late 70s into the 80s. Amazingly, 17 of their songs have gone to the top 10 in the UK. Uh, they started a movement that's effects we still feel today, every day. I'm talking about one of my favorites, Madness, and their only big hit in America with Our House. Our house in the middle of our so uh, the plan was for each of the seven band members of the legendary British ska band uh, Madness to jot down their childhood memories and what they remembered the most about their families. The happy times, the sad times. It was supposed to be the theme uh, behind the group's fourth studio album, The Rise and Fall, a thematic album. However, only multi-instrumentalist Carl Smith, known as Chaz Smash, bothered to follow this plan. Chaz's writing became a a sort of Norman Rockwell-like portrait of a British family captured in the nostalgic New Wave era classic, Our House. In the, middle of our, our house it has a crown. the genesis of madness that came from the formation of the North London Invaders in Camden Town with uh, Monsieur Barso, Mike Barson on keyboards, uh, Chrissy Boy, Chris Foreman on lead guitar and kicks, of course, Lee Thompson on sax and vocals. Drummer John Hassler, he came shortly after then followed by Suggs, Graham McPherson, to be the group's lead singer. The last musician to join Madness was actually Carl Smith, the aforementioned uh, Chaz Smash. All seven of the Madness boys uh, were nutty. That's how you say it. But Chaz Smash quickly earned the reputation as being the nuttiest of the bunch. Have you seen OS? Sorry? OS. Have you seen it? Chaz was a perfect fit for the, the zany persona of Madness. So much so that the original members enlisted Chaz to perform in their breakout hit, a cover of Jamaican musician producer Prince Buster's One Step Beyond. One Step Beyond! Carl Smith wasn't even uh, officially part of the band at that point. 
nor had he been given the nickname Chaz Smash yet when he was asked to deliver the iconic spoken intro of One Step Beyond. Such a fabulous song. Don't watch that. Watch this. This is the heavy, heavy monster sound. The guys decided to call themselves a madness because madness was the title of their favorite song by Prince Buster. Madness. Madness. They call it madness. Along with the specials and the beat and the selector, Madness became one of the big four in the British ska subgenre of the early 80s new wave movement. Of those big four, Madness was definitely the most prolific on the UK singles chart. Madness was rampant on the charts. Like I said, 20 top 20 singles from 79 through 1985. In 1982, Madness put the blueprint together for their fourth studio LP, The Rise and Fall. Uh, the early concept of the record was for the songs, like I said, to tell stories from each band member's childhood. Very nostalgic. No one followed through with this except for Chad. So let's reminisce. Uh, as a child growing up in the working class area of West London, uh, family and friends called him Carl instead of Cathal, which was uh, his rather stuffy first name given to him at birth by his Irish immigrant parents. Uh, when Carl began to put his thoughts together for a song, uh, he started to reminisce about the heartwarming simplicity and the innocence of growing up in a typical British family of the 1960s. Mother's tired, she needs a rest. The kids are playing up downstairs. The house that Carl and his family lived in was way too small for eight people, but that's all Carl and his five siblings knew. Like every other family in the neighborhood, the Smiths weren't living high on the hog. The Smiths, funny. Uh, it was really a, a blue-collar existence. Money was just as tight as the living quarters. Happiness came from the sanctity of a loving mother and a father and the carefree comfort of family. She's the one they're going to miss in lots of In our house, Carl focused on just the happy times. Everything was true. I stayed away from recounting the bad times of his youth, which were very traumatic, apparently. Carl was 11 in 1970. His father got a new job and the Smith family moved to Coraline. Uh, it was in Northern Ireland. During that time that Carl was frequently victimized by bullies, uh, hooligans as they were called. Uh, after a month of being hazed and beaten by these bullies uh, very badly, Carl finally told his father you know, what was happening to him. His father told him to quit school and just stay home. So that's what he did. Carl stayed home and helped his mom while she gave birth to twins. Now, despite the bullying, Carl looked back on his childhood very fondly. And he shared an insightful perspective of his teen years uh, that you know, many of us can relate to. That's why this song is so transcendent. I think it's uh, when you're 16, maybe 17, you know, during that transition to adulthood. It's a feeling that comes over you that you're going to have to leave home soon. You're going to have to leave the nest. At the end of the first chorus of Our House, Carl wrote, and of course, Sugg sang about that strange internal premonition. Something tells you that you've got to move away from it. Growing up, of course, can be very frustrating and downright traumatic, even in your own household. You know, the constant fighting with your siblings, I know all about that. The constant struggle for privacy, you know, being subjected to the seemingly unreasonable rules of your parents and trying to figure out who you are and where you fit in this crazy journey called life. There are many days when you can't wait to leave the house, to leave your town. For me, it was my small town of Blackfoot, Idaho. You know, go out on your own. But when that day comes on the verge of emancipation, you're kind of weirdly afraid. It's almost as if you know that when you leave, things are never going to be the same. You can never go home again. A bittersweet feeling, that's expressed in the middle eight, and I love it. Suggs didn't write a song for the Rise and Fall album as Chaz had done. His origin story, very different. Uh, born Graham McPherson, Suggs, he didn't know his biological father at all. 
His father died when he was just three years old. Now, Sugg's mother, Edith Gower, she was a jazz singer. His father, William McPherson, he processed photographs. Suggs learned that his late father was a troubled individual whose life was overtaken by, uh, unfortunately, heavy heroin use. After the death of William McPherson, Edith and her young son moved to Liverpool, where she sang in jazz clubs. 1965, Edith was voted Jazz Newcomer of the Year in the Melody Maker magazine. Uh, she frequently performed uh, at the Blue Angel. This was a lounge that was located near the Cavern Club, where the Beatles were discovered by their eventual manager, Brian Epstein. Now, like his friend Chaz Smash, Suggs dropped out of school. Uh, before his career as Suggs, he worked as a butcher, uh, also as a designer. Suggs became a leader of madness, and he and Chaz were very close. Now, even though his childhood memories uh, didn't exactly mirror the images that Chaz projected in his song, he did feel the nostalgic power of our house, and he interpreted it famously in his lead vocal. There's always something happening, and it's usually quiet. The Rise and Fall album was highly acclaimed in the British press. Uh, the New Music Express magazine praised the LP as the best Madness record, period. It was an experimental album for Madness with an interesting blend of ska, jazz, music hall, and Eastern influences all over the place. Now, as we continue to break down this song, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses I always wear. Speaking of mother, father, sister, brother, um, you can get new glasses for everyone in your house without breaking the bank with Zenny. Design your own pair of glasses to suit your needs or your style from the shape, the color, the type of frame. So much to choose from. There's reading glasses, migraine relief, progressives, transition lenses, and bifocals, just to name but a few. Just click on the info button right up here to get up to 80% off regular retail prices. You're going to love it. So performing on the album, including Our House, were the crazy, lovable Madness 7, talking about Graham Suggs McPherson on vocals, Mike Barson on keys, Lee Kicks Thompson on sax, Chris Chrissy Boy Foreman guitars, a Carl Chaz Smith on trumpet and backing vocal, Dan Woody Woodgate on drums, uh, Mark Betters Bedford on bass, uh, and a bright feel-good brass and string arrangement that was created by David Bedford. He actually passed away in 2011. It was the first time that the band worked with an arranger like Bedford, and the results were absolutely magical. Our house was an anomaly for Bedford as well. He was primarily known for his work with Mike Oldfield, Tubular Bells fame. Uh, that was the theme of the horror classic of The Exorcist, of course. The brass section on the track, that was executed by Lee Kicks Thompson on sax and Chaz on trumpet, just perfectly. The lyrics were written by Chaz. Uh, it was Chris Foreman, one of the group's main writers, who composed the music for our house. So everybody got in on this one. Longtime Madness collaborators Clive Langer and Alan Winstonley, uh, they produced the track. Uh, you probably recognize their names. Uh, they would later work with Morrissey in the early days of his solo career. And then with They Might Be Giants on their famed Flood album, did a great job. As the lead single for the record, Our House broke new ground for Madness in America. It was their first and only hit single in the States, like I said. Even though Our House was their lone hit in America, I, I just can't refer to Madness as a one-hit wonder. They're just far too prolific in other parts of the world for anyone to label them as such. It's like when people call AHA that. Uh, the fact is, Our House by Madness was one of the most impactful songs of the 80s. In the It was a multi-format sensation that was pivotal in the emergence of new wave that defined the decade, you know, from 1982 through 1986, and it's become a pop culture sensation in America since then. Single rose to number seven on the Billboard Hot 100. It went to number nine on the U.S. Rock Chart. It went to number 21 on the U.S. Dance Chart. And the comical music video with Nutty Boy Chaz wearing a dress and apron playing the house proud mum. Classic. It was heavily played on MTV. Uh, truly a classic. Madness was certainly at their peak in the 80s, 82 to 83 especially. Single 
It was selected as best song at the 1983 Ivor Novello Awards. And that same year, Our House was actually nominated for a Grammy Award for best pop performance by a duo or group with vocals. Back when the Grammys mattered. The follow-up to The Rise and Fall was the Keep Moving album, which yielded several more Madness hits, Wings of a Dove, The Sun and the Rain, Michael Caine, and One Better Day. The next record, the band's sixth studio album, uh, Mad Not Mad, that was released in 85, had three more top 40 hit singles in the UK, but unfortunately the band started to implode. The guys started to hate each other, actually. There was too much madness. <laughs> Sorry. Chrissy Boy actually attacked Kicks with a knife and a fork at one time. There was another time when Chris tried to smash two bottles over Kicks' head. Uh, there was apparently always a wild recklessness inside the group that lived up to the band's name, for sure. All seven members had a history of mischief. Like I said before, a few of them even had a criminal record. Uh, Suggs was arrested as a teenager for public fighting and disturbing the peace. Kicks was in juvenile court for burglary. Uh, Woody dealt narcotics. Chrissy Boy was held by police for stealing records and mopeds, apparently. <laughs> Betters got caught writing graffiti. Uh, Barso was thrown in the slammer for smashing lights with a bat when he was 18 years old. And on several occasions during some of the early vaudeville-like madness uh, live shows, Chaz got into a brawl with some hostile people in the audience. Actually, madness was kicked off Top of the Pops a record four times because of brash behavior. But after each incident, the BBC gave him another chance because this band was so incredibly popular across the UK and Europe. Madness live right over there. Now, when the band did break up in 1986, each member fell on hard times, financially, emotionally, and physically. There have been reunions and spinoffs here and there, you know, where three or four members worked together on a project. There was a time when uh, Chaz, Suggs, Chrissy Boy, and Kicks put out an album as The Madness. But effectively, Madness as we knew them, it was over. Get this, Chaz once called Madness the working man's Pink Floyd. <laughs> I love that. Although he was half joking, there is an element of truth to that tongue-in-cheek statement. Uh, I mean, Madness made concept albums, and they were quite experimental, like Pink Floyd. And a song like Our House has evolved into an iconic symbol of really working class structure, not only in its depiction of a British family living in a council house. It's a realistic illustration of how the everyday struggles of family life in any country are just as beautiful as they are monotonous. Our house is an asylum from all that bad stuff that happens outside of the house. Our house in the middle of our street is both a castle and a keep. You know, funny story to end on about this song. My youngest son has autism. And when he was, he was six years old, he discovered the song, came on when we were driving one time. He became infatuated with this classic. He knew every word. He sang it incessantly. He sang it so much, I got a call from his first grade teacher who said he, he wouldn't stop singing it in the middle of the class for hours and hours at a time. Our house was our castle and our king. Our house. I mean, nothing against her. She understood that he had autism, but it was becoming a, a serious disruption you know, to all the other kids in the class. So I had to talk to him, you know, and help him to understand that he couldn't just break out into our house, into this song, whenever he, he felt like it. I remember he said, Dad, I can't help it. It's such a cool song. My brain just takes over. It takes over my mouth and I can't stop singing it. So I helped him with some brain exercises and he had enough self-control to overcome it. <laughs> this kid, he is so fun, especially when he was little. So I guess a few months later, he was in class and our house got the better of him. He started humming it uh, during a test. You know, he was like, hmm. He was trying not to. And all of a sudden, within seconds, apparently the entire class started singing the song in unison. 
his classmates, his friends. I mean, they'd heard him sing it so much, they found the song on their own, and it became a favorite of all of theirs. And instead of Our House in the Middle of Our Street, they actually changed the lyrics to Our House in the Middle of Our Class. I thought that was pretty, pretty cool. Hey, the power of 80s music. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Madness and Our House. What are your memories of this song? What are your memories of this band? Let's have a great discussion about this band. So great. You gotta listen to their other stuff. Uh, if you like our content, we invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friend.